I actually was taken in the woods by two gunmen. Um, the driver wanted to kill a prostitute that night and the passenger had changed his mind. And after hours of being in that car and you know being beaten and raped and the, the driver kept on putting the gun to my head um, and the other guy kept on arguing with him, I started screaming, go ahead and kill me, kill me, please, kill me, because I thought if they could just kill me, it would all be over with. This has been researched, it has been documented, music heals. And country music with those lyrics really You look heals. like a country music singer. <laughs> I'm, I'm tempted. Today, she was a teen prostitute and drug addict. Now she's a successful corporate consultant and founder of The Teen Project, a program to help troubled teens turn their life around. Lori Burns, author of Punish for Purpose, joins us. Oh, and did I mention she's had 25 foster kids? And then Dr. Gilda, the country music doctor, uses country music to help heal your broken heart and answer all of your questions about love and life. Up first, Lori Burns. Pleasure to meet you, Lori. Thank you for having me. Well, the statistic you have on the back of the book is pretty powerful. You say 20 to 25,000 youth are homeless and living on the streets in California alone. That's actually the United States. Oh, the United States. Yes. Mm -hmm. 20 to 25,000 leave every year from the foster care system, so it's increasing every year. We have no idea to the number that's out there now. Wow. But with them pouring out on the street every year, it's just increasing every year. Yeah. And you were one of them at one point. That's true, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you, you had a, a hell of an upbringing. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, so, um, but when I was one of them, I didn't realize it was because foster care ended and um, I got shoved out on the street. I thought it was my own personal circumstance. It wasn't until much later that I realized. But so you were the, we were talking beforehand, you know, you don't always fit sometimes a stereotype of what people may think for what you've gone through, not that there necessarily is the, you know, the person who does, but but you were the nice Jewish girl from right, the, the yeah. suburbs in a way, yeah. but, but what, your father was a tyrant at home. My father was an alcoholic. He was uh, physically abusive on me and sexually abusive on my older sister. A very angry man. Mm -hmm. And your mother... My mo yeah, my mother took a lot of pills, um, prescription drugs, to kind of shut out the whole thing. So she wasn't emotionally available, unfortunately. And But your father would beat you? Right. My father would beat me. Um, since the time I was a baby, he didn't want me, so. Wow. Uh, you know, and uh, I mean, I know these things happen, obviously, mm -hmm. as you know better than anybody. Right. But yet, it's still hard for me to sit there and think, you know, how can you do this to your own kid? Yeah, I think it's a cycle. You know, when I started writing the book, I, I did a lot of interviews on my own family because I didn't know what happened when I was a baby, so I had to ask my mom. And what I found out over the years that I was planning and writing the book was that my dad was an abused child. He was a foster kid as uh, well. Because one thing you mentioned, mm -hmm. I know, is that what he didn't really like to talk about his father right. or his upbringing, right. or, mm -hmm. and there is such a vicious cycle then. Yeah. But you got used to what you knew how to read him or his mood and knew when to hide. and. Yeah. But that didn't always work, though. No, it didn't always work, no. He would find me. If he had enough patience, he would find me. Mm -hmm. oh. so. And it got to the point where he actually had you committed to an institution for the criminally insane? Right. He, um, he was a pilot for a commercial airline. So he was leaving and coming back, um, kind of unpredictable. And my mom was gone at this t time. And I had a friend over, so a friend had witnessed the abuse. And he was so scared that he would get in trouble, that he hit a gun, called the police, and said that I was out to kill him and I had a gun. And um, they put me in a mental institution for yeah. the criminally insane, tied me to and, a bed and, and in and a And the police jacket. never even really asked you for your side of the story, did well, they? Well, I think it was the 70s, you know, so it's a lot different now. There's a lot more, um, there's a lot more um, people advocating for kids that are out there, and there's a lot more about child abuse. You hear about it in school now. I mean, seriously. Anyone in today's world looking at how I was, how my behavior was, would have realized something was wrong before the event even happened sure. in my behavior. Well, because I think at schools, yeah. probably they're even more sophisticated, and the police certainly, I think even, you know, things like domestic violence and mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, I think there's not, hopefully that's your experience or your opinion too, mm -hmm. that it's not quite the tendency to just sweep it under the rug not and anymore. not talk about it. Back or, then it may have been, you know. but not anymore. And you know, even when the, I was in the police car with the man, in the 70s, a child really wouldn't um, start talking to an adult about anything serious, you know. Today, I think kids are a lot more bold. 
and even in the institution themselves, so they never really... No, it's, you know, I write about it in the book. My aunt had asked me to keep it a secret for my dad so he didn't lose wow. his job. And I wanted my dad to love me so bad that I agreed that I wouldn't tell. So I kept the secret, and it's actually the secret that drove me down into drug addiction and then eventually prostitution. Mm -hmm. It was the bad. And I think that's the thing mm -hmm. that hit me, you know, like when, the, when your mother didn't say anything and when your father did it, mm -hmm. but yet the fact that you too, in a way, I mean, I'm not, I don't yeah, believe no. I'm blaming the victim, no, but you. that you actually went along with it so much of the time right. or with what yeah. was being forced right. well, on you. As a kid, you're looking up to the adults to guide you, and even though you know you're kind of crazy at some point, you know, you still don't have anyone else to rely on, so. That's all you can go with. Well, in a way, it's like your whole world's being swept out from underneath you, right. though. Because, I mean, what do you, it's not like you have a lot of options or resources. Right. and I was suicidal. Kind of on, that, was my, that was my out. So I thought if I could just kill myself, then I don't have to deal with it. But I didn't have any rational thought of a proactive way to handle it. Well, we'll come to everything that you've done since then in the, in the way that you've turned this around, but I just wanted to kind of, you know, put it in perspective for people maybe who are going through this, to, right. you know, and, and, and so much of what you do cover in the book. So your mother finally got you out of the institution. She did. She was actually, I was brought up in New York. My mom was out here in California looking for a place for us, and then she was going to send for us. So she had um, called back home for months, and my sister and dad were saying I was outside playing. And then she finally got in touch with a doctor who said a child was... She's been outside playing a long time. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Like, something's gone wrong here. And she found me in there and got me out. Thank God. Mm -hmm. And then what happened, though, when you came out here? Because it actually took even kind right. of a, a worse Well, by the time turn. I got out, I mean, being tied to a bed in a straitjacket and drugged, you know, at the age of 13, right after my bas mitzvah, was just um, something that I couldn't endure, and I think I had a spiritual deadening in that institution. And by the time I got out, I was just no longer normal. You know, I was driven towards suicide. So there was nothing that could stop me. I was kind of hellbound. And um, when I got out here, I got involved in crime and drugs and eventually prostitution. Prostitution. We'll be right back. And we are back with Lori Byrne. She is author of Punished for Purpose. So the prostitution, how mm -hmm. did you get into that? Actually, my sister. Um, my sister hung out with a lot of rich men. Mm -hmm. And um, at this time, I had a child. I had a baby. And I was on welfare. And my sister thought that maybe it would help me to get some more money and turned me on to my first trick, my first job. Wow. Mm -hmm. So your sister, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did it go? How did it pan out? <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's a funny question, but the first time I ever went um, on a call as a prostitute, it was a call service, and um, there were three men there. They were all doctors, and they were scared of the possibility of a... Um, Contracting AIDS or something, so oh. they didn't do anything with me. They Should actually, be worried about getting arrested. But yeah, <laughs> but anyway, they, that's, yeah uh, they actually gave me a bunch of money and sent me home. So mm -hmm. that um, experience made me want to do it more. So. Wow. Yeah. And then, how long were you doing it? I I worked for the call service for just a short period of time because I was also um, getting addicted to heroin at the time. Um, a person that I was around had turned me onto some heroin, and I thought, you know, it sounded. And this attractive. was kind of in the air. I mean, this was more not quite the 60s, but the 70s. It was still kind of the 80s now. Oh, 80s. Yeah, 80s okay, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. And yeah. um, the heroin allowed me to relax and stop thinking about all the drama of my life. You know, it allowed me to just forget about it all. So, but then I started getting addicted. So one day, I just walked out to the streets and started prostituting on the street. And what was that like being on? It was Tragic. I mean, it, at first it felt powerful to get that much money. I mean, I figured I could get as much money as I wanted in a day's time. Um, but when I started getting kidnapped and raped and beaten and um, And was that the, I mean, it usually didn't go very well? I mean, oh, it was no, usually, it doesn't go very well on the streets, no. And so it's not, I mean, I guess the women who have a John or whatever, that mm -hmm. maybe there's a little more protection for those women. You that mean like a pimp? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah. In the area that I was in, that wasn't real um, big, you know, having a pimp. It was just um, girls walking out on the street, young girls. And unfortunately, today, they're getting that through Craigslist, and it's even easier to get into prostitution yeah. these days, and you know, killed and on sex Craigslist. trafficking. Yeah, right. So um, it's still there for teens that um, don't have a place to go or who um, are on a suicidal path like I was. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book, because I thought if I could deliver the path out, you know. So, so how did you get out? I actually was taken in the woods by two gunmen. 
Um, the driver wanted to kill a prostitute that night and the passenger had changed his mind. And after hours of being in that car and you know being beaten and raped and the, the driver kept on putting the gun to my head um, and the other guy kept on arguing with him, I started screaming, go ahead and kill me, kill me, please kill me. Because I thought if they could just kill me, it would all be over with. And um, they knocked me out, left me on the side of the canyon road. And a man, I talk about 13 angels and teachers in my book, the people that guided me out of the path of hell into heaven because I, I really live a marvelous life. But that first angel was a man in a white van, I'll never know who he was, mm -hmm. picked me up off the road and took me to the hospital. Wow. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, did they ever catch the guys or? Yeah, you know, it's funny. So people ask me that all the time, but as a prostitute, you really don't report. You know, because mm -hmm. of all the abuse you would take from the police for having done that to yourself, You'd and I already get more hated flat myself. Than the guys who almost yeah. killed you. I already hated myself enough that I didn't need to bring more abuse on myself. Mm -hmm. You know. And so I'm assuming that nobody along the way ever was ever prosecuted for rape or no, for being here or no. anything. Pretty much. No. Okay. So, well, as I say, you know, now you've got the teen project and you've had mm -hmm. the corporate consulting and so how did your angels lead you to, well, first of all, you're making good money or you, yeah, you've got yeah. the whole corporate yeah. uh, consulting, a defense contractor thing going on. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come out of all of this? And, and well, you know, that's a funny story. I, um, so I started being a foster. I got sober when I was 23 and by the time I was 26, the first kid was left at my house. And then I became a foster mom and I started oh, taking left at your kids. House. Yeah, I was babysitting the little girl. And I actually offered to watch her for a month so her mom could get help from a co cocaine addiction. Hmm. And um, the mom never came back. Wow. So that was my, she's now 32 years old. But I've had 25 kids and um, I had my own kid was in foster care, got her back. Hmm. And then I started, I went through therapy of course because I had a lot of abuse issues to deal with. But I worked for a girl, I was about 24 and my boss was 24. Oh. And my boss was just amazingly successful. Drove a BMW, owned a condo. I mean, I had just literally walked in off the streets. So I faked it until I made it, you know, I was kind of faking, you know, being normal because I was nowhere near, near normal. Her name was Cindy and I actually started emulating her without her knowing. Mm. Could be like another movie, right? Um, <laughs> but um, I started saying when I felt insecure, I'm gonna be Cindy today. Uh -huh. And then there was a group of other people that I watched that were successful and I took on their traits and I put that all in the book so that it's kind of like um, a set of tools that anyone could use. I mean, if a prostitute- So you were smart. Yeah, if a prostitute could use it to get in a heroin act and you know, my schooling was like juvenile hall and mental institutions, you know. So um, I just adopted their beliefs into what I was doing and kind of faked it. And then all of a sudden, my life opened up. Now, I was curious, because you mentioned the, the defense yeah. contractor, mm -hmm. I'm assuming there was a security clearance or something like that, or were, were there any issues because of the background or, or not? You know, you know, there was a seven year, and it was past the seven years by the time I started. You ah. have to go back seven years. Okay. Yeah. Well, and again, I don't know, I mean, blaming the victim, I mean, so yeah, I'm glad right. that uh, at least Well, you know, not everyone sees you as the victim, view. unfortunately, well, so. Because, um, yeah, even with my kids today, you know, you've been abused, and then you get into the cycle of being the abuser, you know? And it's hard to undo all that. Well, and so now, again, fantastic. You've got the teen project, mm -hmm. and you're actually working with, I mean, been there, done that. I mean, right. you, you know it firsthand right. and are able to help these kids. So what do, you, what do you do for them, and how do you, I mean, for instance, you say that really the system treats them worse than probably adult prisoners because, right. it, well, as you said at the beginning, I think, that they get dumped out on the street without any money or anything, whereas right. prisoners even get money or welfare or something. $200 at the gate or, for a prisoner. Okay. So um, I had had 18 foster kids by the time I realized what was happening, and it was devastating to me so I started the teen project and I didn't even have a name for it I just kept on calling it that teen project thing so we named it the teen project but what I found out was foster care ends abruptly at 18 now I didn't know that because my kids stay my kids for life but it ends abruptly at 18 and 65% of these kids go to court that day and they need to leave they need to leave the only safe home they know so they walk out with no money no job no car wow. no, no bank account and no family to return to and they're 40% of our nation's homeless population. So well, it's I devastating. I realize you just get chopped off and kicked yeah, out. No on one the... realizes it. It's like America's big secret. And I think yeah. it's double dipping on the abuse. I mean, we took them in. We said we'd protect them from these abusive parents. And we know all along we're going to throw them out at 18. So the teen project started taking the kids back home and we put them through college and we call ourselves a parent to the parentless. We're all volunteers mm. and we spend our extra time working on this. So how many people are involved and how many teens have you worked with? We have like 30 volunteers and we've got um, 
We helped 150 teens on the street last year, actually 154. We have um, five girls that we're supporting to go through college, and we have them in a brand new house in Orange County. And then we have other um, teens that are scattered, scattered throughout um, transitional housing in Orange County, where we pay their rent and we help them to get stabilized again. But really, we have a national outreach where I'm mentoring oh. girls in seven other states right now. Oh. And um, we're hoping it'll be 52 states by 2012. Is that your goal, is to get them to go to college or into schooling or education? Well, is to be a parent. The, uh, be you know, they have no parents. And an 18-year-old is not ready to go out on their own. Well, I think you talk about in the book mm -hmm. the fact that what most people, these, the, even these days, you know, are dependent on their adults until, what, mid-20s or right. almost late-20s. Right. 26. And, and these kids have nothing after 18. Right. They're just booted out. And not only that, our kids get life skills, you know, from us. But foster kids and group home kids, they jump around so much, they don't get any, they don't have any parenting, per se, um, to teach them how to open a bank account and all those things that we would know growing up with our biological parents. And it sounds like you've had some success stories already with people in school and kids. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have one girl who's pre-med. Hmm. Her name's Janelle, and she's brilliant. And um, her little sister, Hannah, lives with us, and she's going to Montessori School to be a teacher. Ah. And Carla, who was featured on CNN like a month ago, oh. um, she's going to Paul Mitchell, and we were able to get a full scholarship for her. And then we have Ashley. She's a CNC machinist. Hmm. And... Um, I think I'm missing one, but yeah, we have a we have a good group of girls over there. Well, keep up the great work. It's amazing, and you're amazing. Thank I love you. the way you've <laughs> turned it around. You'd never guess, honestly, what you've Thank gone you. through, but it's more power to you. Lori Burns, the book is Punished for Purpose. We'll be right back. And we are back. Joining me now is Dr. Gilda Carl, the country music doctor. Great to have you here Hi. today, Dr. Gilda. So nice to be here. This is your CD, Country Cures. Yes. So I love this because, you know, you think of country music, no offense, but it's what, like, booze and broken hearts, right? <laughs> so. It's still booze and it's still broken, <laughs> broken hearts. <laughs> and so what a great thing, though, that you're using this, or country music, to, what, to give relationship advice. And I'm a relationship expert. And for years and years and years, I've been listening to country music. And now that the economy is so mm. awful and people are so well, I'll be miserable. singing the blues. <laughs> Everybody's singing the blues. And I had this bright idea not too long ago to marry country music with the relationship advice that I give. Mm -hmm. And as I started to do this internationally with clients who I have, one after another said, oh my God, that made me feel so much better. And I said, whoa, I'm really onto something. Well, the power of music in uh, addition to uh, Well, um, this has been researched, it has been documented, music heals. And country music, with those lyrics, Really you look heels. like a country music singer. I'm, I'm tempted to put you on the spot and have you sing, Reba. Oh, thank, you know, you. Uh... thank you very much. I can't sing. But I do write. Oh. And, and what I do is offer my advice on these country cures. These are little features that I have a few of on my website, drgilda.com. And those are just samples of what we've been doing lately. And I just want to say, you will get, get like millions of hits oh. on your website and the yeah. YouTube videos yeah. and whatever else you've got yeah. out there. Yeah, the internet has, has been just wonderful to me. I have clients who I give instant, what I call instant advice from my website. I, I give that to them from all over the world. I have clients in every country imaginable. It's wonderful. We can Skype. We can, we can be on the telephone, we can do email. It's, it's incredible, the power of the internet. Well, and I love the fact, though, that this is just a, such a different take on it because, you know, we've had a lot of psychologists or relationship experts yeah. and even divorce attorneys talking about relationships and all sorts of things. But, but the country music side, you know, is just such a great take on it. I know, and, and a producer named me the country music doctor. I said, you know, <laughs> I, 
I think I'm going to keep that name. <laughs> Other than opera, I was thinking maybe opera would work too, you know. <laughs> the classical <Ta> music doctor. <laughs> There's a lot of crazy stuff at opera too, but I think yes, country there music, is. you know. But I think country music is so pop culture. And now more and more there are so many crossover <laughs> musicians who are coming over to the mainstream sure. and who are going over to country music that sometimes even I, who am, and I'm pretty well up on the country music stars and the whole country music industry, even I have to question, wait a minute, is this person pop or is this person from country? I mean, I, I really question this now. Well, you've even got some of your American Idol people, like Carrie Underwood. Carrie you know. Underwood. Look at look at look what happened with her career. I mean, it's it's amazing, uh, and and others. Look at Taylor Swift, sure, sweet sure. young girl, who writes her own music and sings, and she's on pop stations. Yeah. So, which yeah. isn't? I mean, she's even like part of the whole Disney franchise or something. Yes. I think, isn't she? But you, you almost incredible. think of that more as like Miley Cyrus instead that of Miley you know. Cyrus. Oh my God! Her song, the 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 her latest, her her older song, uh, about taking the journey, and it's all about the climb, and it's not so much about the end result, but it's about what you are doing as you're getting to where you have to go. I mean, how does such a young person know? Was she about 17, I, I think? Right. I don't know, how so. does such a young person have that much She wisdom? listened to her father's song, Achy Breaky Heart. Yes. And on that note, is that one of the songs that you use? Have you ever used Achy Breaky Heart for... No, uh, that, that started, <laughs> that song became popular before I became the country music doctor. I'm using things that are oh, much Oh, just the more, more recent. Yeah, okay. much more current. Although so I do take from some songs like the Dixie Chicks. A lot of people don't want to play the Dixie Chicks. Oh, they, they the have that whole music. political yes, thing. Yes, because a while of the ago. politics. Yeah, One yeah. of the things that I do is that I don't talk politics. Mm -hmm. I just raise questions about different things. And one uh, one of their songs is called Travel and Soldier, and it's about a young mm -hmm. man who says to a sweet waitress I hope you don't have anybody in your life right now who's writing to you because I would like to write to you. Mm -hmm. And the two of them, young people, get together and do communicate through letters. And then suddenly the letters stopped and she goes to a memorial service and his name is read. Mm -hmm. And I question... That was on the CD, by the I way. Know. I Did, thought, wow, that is... I know. That's, that's sad. I that know. Really, so many yeah. people said to me they had tears in their eyes when they heard that take that I had on that. Because my question was not, is war good? Is war bad? Should we be in this war or that war? But my take is, would he ever have approached this beautiful young waitress mm -hmm. had it not been for the push of war and the threat that he might not be here tomorrow. And that raises the issue of what are we doing in our lives? Are we really living every single moment to the best possible extent that we can? And I could do this as a pure plain relationship expert, sure. or, or, or I or can do put it. Put on the song. I was That's trying to think right. what song would be playing in the background when you were saying <laughs> that, you know. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you know, Travel and Soldier. It's oh, beautiful. Right, right, right. It's just so beautiful and so touching. So many other things. For example, uh, John Rich has this song called Shutting Detroit Down. Hmm. People are so phenomenally affected by the economy now. Oh, absolutely. And here is this beautiful video that goes along with the song, but about this man who's been working in this plant for a very, very long time, mm. and what is he going to do if not work that job? And then suddenly, bang, his job is lost. And he says, and my daddy taught me that I'm supposed to work hard, and that's how I will make it in life. And I say, my annotation to that is, yeah, right. And I raise this issue also. Where does hard work get you? And why aren't we juggling a whole bunch of different careers in this difficult economy that we're in? 
Well, I think you're going to end up writing some country music songs, too, oh. by the time this is done. <laughs> oh, from your mouth to God's ears. But I don't know. I've never written. Them. I don't know. I'm a writer, but I've never written country music songs. I don't know. So in our final minute, though, are there any singers in particular that you tend to draw on more than others, or the, the music that you usually Everybody or? who has a story, everybody's story that I can use and apply to current happenings right now, and the pain that people are reaching out to me through the Internet and saying, I need help with that's that's the song that's the, that's the singer and the song that I apply to the people's woes thank you very much Dr. My Gilda pleasure. Carl the country music doctor you can find her online and YouTube radio all over the place thanks everybody for watching we'll see you next time